Friends, the unfortunate reality in our country is that political violence has been on the rise in recent years. Now, it's far more prevalent on the political left, those who seek political power through force rather than through persuasion and organizing and voting. There has been some of it on the political right. But notice there's been a very marked difference in the approach of law enforcement, particularly, and I'm not talking so much about the cops, particularly prosecutors in regards to prosecuting and punishing those crimes. Because on the left, if we look at the race riots, for example, Example, that decimated American cities throughout 2020, particularly in the summer months. We see in many liberal cities, places like Chicago, where people even who attacked cops with ample evidence were not prosecuted at all. Or in places like Portland, a city that was ravaged by Antifa and similar leftist agitators. If they were prosecuted, they were prosecuted for the most minimal of crimes. Contrast that with the January 6th riot, which is inexcusable, particularly those who committed violence against cops, where there was an absolute maximalist approach taken by prosecutors, people charged with the utmost of crimes that were possible uh, under the circumstances. And by the way, even some people who did not commit violence at all, who had been held indefinitely in what I believe is a political prison in Washington, D.C. But on the left wing side of the, of the equation, finally, some good news, believe it or not. So joining me now to discuss that good news is the founder and CEO of the Center for American Liberty, Harmeet Dillon. So Harmeet, regarding Portland, you know, again, as I mentioned, a city that's just been ravaged by violence really now into years. In, uh, in Portland, Andy No is somebody who really did some fantastic on-the-ground reporting. He's somebody I would really refer to as a guerrilla reporter, somebody who embeds himself and gets involved in a scene. He has been viciously attacked on several occasions. Uh, and when I say attacked, I mean life-in-danger kind of attacks at times. But finally, somebody's not just been arrested, but being charged with felony assault. Tell us why this has finally happened, and does it portend more such good news and prosecutorial toughness, Harmeet? Well, thanks, Steve. This is a very interesting development in this case. I've been representing Andy for a couple of years, and Andy was assaulted back in 2019 by this man, uh, John Hacker, who attacked him at a gym and stole his phone. That's what he's being prosecuted for now. John Hacker has a long history of crossing state lines to be a spotter for Antifa, so he doesn't himself dress up in black, but he's one of their scouts. He points out people for them to assault. And he did that with respect to Andy earlier this year. In May of this year, Andy was assaulted again by a gang of Antifa criminals, and this guy pointed him out to that gang. So finally what happened here is, I think, if I were to just read the tea leaves of what's going on here, after years of ignoring this violence in their city, including attacks on uh, the police, including attacks on the federal courthouse there, I think that it is bad for business, for Democrats in Portland, to mm -hmm. allow this type of violence to continue. And so they approached Andy and right. said, you know, would you like to do something about the situation? And so he then went before a grand jury. Grand jury did indict this man. And there's an arrest warrant out for him. So that's some good news. It isn't because the Democrats want to do the right thing right. necessarily. It's because they have no right. choice now. People are beginning to call for that, even on the left. Sure. And I, and I think one of the reasons, Armie, that they're finally calling for it, if we look even outside of the Andy No situation, as serious as that is, if we look at Portland as a whole, and I want to show some statistics here, I always like to put numbers out there. I always like to put data as much as I can. If we look at the data of what's been going on in Portland, 2019, 2020, 2021, if we look, for example, on that chart at homicides and arson crimes, because I think these are two of the most violent attacks uh, which have largely emanated from Antifa and, and Antifa itself, and I would, I would argue just the broader breakdown of law and order, in Portland. We see that from 2019, a relatively normal year for violent crime in Portland, to 2020, massive jump. The arson, the, the rate of arson just about doubled. The race of, uh, rate of homicides up about 60 percent. If we then look at this year, and that is just year to date through September, we see that unfortunately the homicide rate, we have already eclipsed the terrible 2020 numbers. And on the arson rate, we're at least on track to come somewhere near the 2020 rate. So do you believe have the good citizens of Portland, most of whom are not radicalized, have they finally had enough? Are these kinds of numbers that I'm talking about, are they making the reality so untenable that these prosecutors, you know, you've been talking about, they finally have to, if they, if they won't see the light, they have, to, they have to feel the heat now and act. Well, this is a very sudden change in Portland and other cities. Uh, indeed, you're seeing citizens in San Francisco and Los Angeles and others move to recall 
their prosecutors who are very liberal. And in right. Portland, the prosecutor, Mike Schmidt, is getting flack from Antifa because they felt safe under him for some time, and suddenly he seems to have turned on them. So, look, I don't assign any benign intent to these uh, leaders of Portland. They are reaping what they sow. But the mayor sure. of Portland, Ted Wheeler, himself has been, you know, besieged his building, and so he, he is finally beginning to talk the talk as well. And so I, I, I hope for the citizens of Portland that this trend continues. Um, people from Antifa still show up at Andy Noe's house with weapons and threaten his family. And so that's what happens when people threaten the left. That's how they react. So this is a very serious situation meant to deter any right. journalist from covering these crimes. And, and Andy is a brave journalist for standing up to them. It's an honor to represent him. And I wish there were more like him. Well, thank you for doing that important advocacy work. Now, you know, you mentioned your home city of San Francisco, and uh, the DA there is certainly in trouble right now, as well he should be, uh, facing potential recall. I want to put up a tweet that Chesa Boudin put out there in the public that he posted, and it said this, among other things, talking about his father, who has been in jail for decades until very recently, got clemency from Governor Cuomo in New York for a triple murder, which included the murder of two police. Uh, and, and one of the things he said is he never intended harm yet his crime devastated many families. He never intended harm. Very curious thing for a prosecutor to say, even if he is talking about his own father, for a prosecutor to think that, to then write that, and to then post that publicly. In my view, that alone would justify a recall. But tell me, uh, is this a recall of the Gavin Newsom variety that's likely going nowhere, or is there perhaps some teeth to this recall of Chesa Boudin? Well, let me tell you something. This is a 90 percent plus Democrat city. And a lot of the Democrats I know, uh, including the people who are very close to me, have signed those papers to recall this man. So this is absolutely not. You look on Nextdoor and other apps like that. Uh, even the liberals in the city are fed up with the crime, fed up with the danger. And Asian Americans are particularly leading this charge in San Francisco because it has mm -hmm. been the Asian American elderly who are being assaulted in broad daylight by repeat criminals that Kesa Boudin and other prosecutors have let out into our cities and getting away with it. So that's untenable. It does not work uh, long term for a city, and the city is spiraling out of control. And so I think, yes, the civic leaders of these cities, as much as they are not big fans of law and order or the rhetoric behind what's going on, they can no longer uh, tolerate it because their own jobs are at risk. So that's what's happening in our American cities today. Sure. Finally, it's getting bad enough for them to do something about it. Right. Understood. Harmeet Dillon, always great to see you. Thank you for being on the show this evening. Appreciate it. Thank you.